viewers. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Ronan, and thanks for inviting me uh, to Wolfenson Hall and to where I can be there in person. Um, so, okay, so this is uh, a joint work with uh, Shoshen Lugangu, Theo McKenzie, and Siddhant Monti, who are all from UC Berkeley. Uh, and it's about nodal domains and random regular graphs. And feel free to stop me at any moment if you have any, any questions. So here's an outline of the talk. So I'll start by giving some history and motivation of this type of question uh, from other areas in math, like spectral geometry. Uh, then I'll talk about nodal domains of discrete graphs and say what's, what's known about them. Uh, then I'll tell you what we proved. Uh, I'll show you a proof of a, a sort of weaker version of a special case of what we proved. Uh, then I'll sketch the ideas in the general proof and I'll end with some, some questions. So let me start with this history and motivation. Uh, so the, the basic example in this subject of nodal domains is this very sim simple uh, ODE. So consider the Laplacian on a one-dimensional interval, zero to pi, and uh, look at its Dirichlet eigenfunctions. So those are L2 functions that satisfy the eigenvalue equation and are equal to zero at the endpoints. And so, uh, you know, we know that you can explicitly compute these and they're just sine of kx, where k is an integer and the corresponding eigenvalue is k squared. Um, so let lambda k be the, the, the kth eigenvalue and fk be the kth eigenfunction. Uh, and you can see that, well, you know, the kth eigenfunction here has, uh, um, I suppose, k minus one zeros uh, and uh, if, uh, the, the pattern I want to emphasize here is that if you look at the zeros of the kth eigenfunction, then they split this interval into k-connected components. So that's a very explicit elementary example. Um, and so this is the type of question we're going to be interested in. How do the zeros of eigenfunctions uh, split the underlying domain into connected components? So this already becomes much more interesting in two dimensions. So suppose I now have a compact domain M in R2 with some smooth boundary. So now I can look at the uh, Dirichlet Laplacian on uh, this domain. And again, this is um, some positive operator. And uh, since the domain is compact, it has some discrete eigenvalues. So I can write them as lambda one, lambda two, and so on in increasing order. So lambda k is the, the kth smallest eigenvalue of the uh, Laplacian. And I have corresponding eigenfunctions f sub k. And OK, these are unique if the eigenvalues are simple. And if there's multiplicity, then you know, there are many different choices. But let's just choose one sequence of eigenfunctions, f sub k. So, so what's a nodal domain? So well, a nodal domain of an eigenfunction is a connected component of m minus the set of zeros of the eigenfunction. Uh, so for example, here, there's a picture of a rectangle in the plane, and this is some kind of a plot of uh, its, I suppose, sixth Laplacian eigenfunction with these uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. And uh, if you look at the zeros, they're kind of where the lines are drawn, and they split this domain into six pieces. Uh, so we're going to be interested in counting the number of these pieces. And I'm going to call the number of nodal domains of an eigenfunction capital N of F. So any questions about the definition of a nodal domain in this setting? OK. Uh, so, so the question we're interested in is, how is the number of nodal domains related to the index of the eigenfunction? So that just means the you know, index of the eigenvalue corresponding to that eigenfunction. Um, and there's a famous result of Courant, uh, which says that, well, okay, the number of nodal domains of the kth eigenfunction is at most k. Um, and there are examples where, where this is achieved, such as the one dimensional example I showed you. Um, and the, the question we're going to be mostly interested in this talk is a question of, uh, sorry, I don't know why, yeah, is a question of uh, lower bounds. So uh, what can we say about lower bounds on the number of nodal domains, given this upper bound of k? And uh, in, in the worst case, you can't say anything. There are uh, examples of, of manifolds where 
uh, the number there's an infinite sequence of eigenfunctions with the index going to infinity, but the number of nodal domains is just two. So for example, there are some examples due to Louis. Uh, and so in this area, what people have focused on is uh, proving lower bounds on the number of nodal domains for some sp special restricted classes of manifolds. Okay, so now I'm talking about general higher dimensional manifolds, not just uh, subsets of R2. And there are many results of this type. Uh, actually, there aren't that many results of this type, but some of the highlights of, of, this, type of, of this type of work is the result of Zeldich and, and Jung, which shows that uh, for certain negatively curved manifolds M, the number of nodal domains goes to infinity as log, polylog of the index, and a result of Ghosh, Reznikov, and Sarnak, which shows that the number of nodal domains grows as K to the 1 12th for certain arithmetic manifolds, assuming some, some other number theory uh, uh, assumptions. So this is kind of, this is the history of this problem in, in spectral geometry. And uh, one of the motivations for this type of question is, uh, comes from this area called quantum chaos. And roughly the phenomenology in this area is that if you have some physical system in which the classical dynamics are chaotic, then this should make some kind of appearance in the quantum description of the system. And one of the guiding conjectures in this area is something called Berry's conjecture. Uh, it's also refined by Rudnick and Tarnak, uh, which says that if you have a classically chaotic manifold, um, which I'm not defining precisely, then um, if you look at the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on that manifold, uh, they should behave like random waves. So they should manifest this chaos in this very particular way. Now, instead of trying to define these things, I'll just show you some pictures I stole from another talk. So in this picture, um, on the left, we have two domains in R2. Uh, so one is just a circle and the other is a cardoid. And if you look at uh, a simple dynamical system on, on this domain, just the billiard, so there's a particle moving around and when it hits the boundary, it gets reflected by the law of equal angles. Uh, then uh, you can ask, well, what do these dynamics look like depending on the shape of the domain? And they look very different in these pictures, as you can see. And then on the right, what's shown is a few eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, and they also look very different. Uh, the ones for the chaotic, uh, you know, for the cardoid, they look, they have much more intricate structure. And this, this Berry's conjecture says that this structure should be explained by some kind of random model. So this is considered to be a very hard conjecture. And how is it related to nodal domains? Well, one implication of this conjecture, if this is true, is that the number of nodal domains should go to infinity with the index of the eigenfunction. Actually, it should go to infinity linearly. And this is a work of Bogo, Molny, and Schmidt. So there's this underlying mathematical physics motivation for studying the number of nodal domains. And the reason people believe they go to infinity is that they believe this random wave conjecture. Okay, so that's, that's all I wanna say about the history of this problem in the sort of continuous setting. Uh, any questions or comments on this? Okay. Okay, so let me now move to the discrete setting and talk about discrete graphs, which is what this work is actually about. Um, so what's the setup? We're gonna look at finite uh, connected graphs on little n vertices. And uh, we're gonna look at, um, okay, the, the adjacency matrix and Laplacian of such graphs. So I suppose everybody here knows what that is. Um, and the Laplacian again is positive semi-definite. I'm gonna write its eigenvalues in increasing order. They're n eigenvalues. Uh, and okay, they're bounded by two times a maximum degree, just to give you a sense of where they are. And I'm gonna call the corresponding eigenfunctions F sub K. So these are all real. Um, and I should say that occasion when I talk about regular graphs, it's equivalent to talk about the adjacency matrix since it has the same, the same eigenvectors. And so sometimes when I talk about regular graphs, I'm gonna talk about the adjacency matrix. And the difference is that this, this flips the spectrum. So it's gonna flip the indexing. 
So lambda one will always be the smallest eigenvector of the Laplacian or the largest eigenvector of the adjacency matrix. Okay, so that's the setup. Now, uh, what's a nodal domain? Okay, so here's the definition we're gonna work with. A nodal domain of an eigenfunction of the Laplacian is a maximal connected component of a graph on which the eigenfunction is either non-negative or non-positive. So, um, okay, so here's a, here's a picture of a graph. Uh, this is, I guess, this is an, an eigenfunction on this graph. Uh, the red vertices are negative, the green vertices are, are positive. And so if you cut all the edges where this eigenfunction changes sign, you get a bunch of connected components. Those are, those are the nodal domains. And I'm gonna refer to that as the number of nodal domains is capital N of F sub of F. So in this case, there are four nodal domains. And uh, okay, the way the nodal domains are defined here with these weak inequalities, they can overlap, it's fine. Uh, now we can ask the same types of questions that how are the numbers of nodal domains related to the index of the eigenfunction? And for upper bounds, there are some very analogous, very nice results. So there's a result of Fiedler from 1975, which says that if the graph is a tree, then the kth eigenfunction actually has exactly k uh, nodal domains defined in this way. And this is this can be viewed as a generalization of this one dimensional example of the interval where we knew exactly how many nodal domains there were. So that's, that's quite nice. Um, and then there's, an, uh, there's actually a discrete analog of Courant theorem proven by uh, Davies, Gladwell, uh, Laidold, and Stadler in 2000. In 2000. Uh, and what this proves, or what this says is that the number of nodal domains of the kth eigenfunction is at most k for any graph. So this has no assumption on the graph. And so, and, uh, so this is a very nice analog of, of Courant theorem. But now you can ask the same question that what is known about lower bounds? So, uh, so in general, there's only one known non-trivial lower bound on the number of nodal domains of some of general graphs. And this is due to Berkeley Lyko from 2008. And what he proved is that if you have a graph with uh, n minus one plus L edges, so you want to think of this as being almost a tree. So tree has n minus one edges, so connected graph with n minus one plus L edges, uh, then the kth eigenfunction of the Laplacian has at least k minus L nodal domains. So if L is small, then you know, for high enough eigenfunctions, you get non-trivial lower bounds out of this. And that's pretty much all that's known for general discrete graphs. So any questions about, about this definition or, or these results? Um, uh, the, the result of the lower bound of the Colaico is for the, for the flips, for the edges, right? For the edges where it's, where, uh, 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 it's inside, not for the number of nodal domains. Uh, I thought you could use it to also get some result like this for the number of nodal domains, or maybe maybe I'm just wrong. No, it's it probably like some kind of a counting argument of uh, yeah. how to relate. Uh, for for the metric graphs, it's uh, it becomes pretty trivial, but for the discrete graph, I'm not sure how the translation would work. Okay. Um, yeah, we can check that later. But uh, in any case, uh, yeah, I guess it uh, it gives some sort of lower bound. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if this is it. We can check it. But thanks. Most most nodal domains only have O of one outgoing edges in this regime. So I mean, actually one plus epsilon. So it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good. So okay. So that's what's known in general. Um, uh, but there's also been quite a bit of interest in uh, in in random regular graphs. So so two models of random regular graphs have been studied. So the first is random d regular graphs for d fixed. So these are sparse random graphs. Uh, this was proposed by Kotos and Smilansky in 1997, and they proposed this as uh, some kind of a discrete toy model of quantum chaos. That this should somehow be a discrete analog of a chaotic manifold. And the main, uh, or you know, one of the main conjectures in this area is a conjecture of Elon from 2008, which I'm gonna call the discrete random wave conjecture. 
and I, I won't precisely state it right now. Uh, I'll say it a bit more later. What the conjecture says is that if you look at uh, any eigenfunction of a, of a random irregular graph or any bulk eigenfunction, let's say, um, then uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a random model which describes what it looks like locally. So in balls around vertices. Uh, so the conjecture roughly says that locally an eigenfunction of a random irregular graph looks like a random eigenfunction of the infinite irregular tree. Uh, so this is some explicit probabilistic local description of what these eigenvectors look like. So this is a conjecture. This is not not proven, but uh, it's believed, and there are many experiments suggesting that it's true. And if it's if it's true, then it implies that the number of nodal domains uh, of random irregular graphs uh, grows linearly, uh, at least in the bulk of the spectrum. So what that means is when k is or, you know some constant multiple of n, the number of nodal domains should be a constant multiple of n. By the way, um, in the continuous case, the Schmidt-Bogomolny conjecture is actually false, and you probably know that. Um, uh, who was it? Uh, Misha Soden and Nazarov actually mm -hmm. proved that there's a constant, and that constant is different to what they were conjecturing. So, is there a constant? You're just giving a lower bound of. of in the random case, uh, yeah. I see. I see. Uh, so, so, is there a constant that goes with the conjecture? That's what I'm saying. So, is there a constant that goes with uh, the discrete conjecture? Because in, in the uh, random wave model, there is now a constant which I call the sudden Nazarov constant, and it's a quite interesting I number. I see. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I don't think this this is strong enough to easily derive the constant uh, is my impression. But it, uh, do the numerics, do the numerics, you said something about numerics, do they actually, uh, D, is, D is fixed. D is fixed, yeah. So so Elon and Smilansky and so on have, have done lots of experiments about this. Uh, that would be the place to look. I don't okay. personally know what the constant is. Okay, thanks. Uh, but in any case, it's, uh, I guess it's predicted that it's order n, uh, and the place to look would be would be those papers, yeah. Um, and yes, there's experimental evidence for this. So Elon did experiments, and seemingly completely independently, Deckel, Lee, and Lineal did also did experiments in the same year, um, and uh, came up with. This is a picture from Deckel, Lee, and Lineal, which shows that as you plot. Yes, the, the slope there is my question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it looks like it looks like uh, you should be able to uh, at least. Yeah, uh, numerically see what that slope is. Uh, I don't know if there's some nice analytic expression for what it is. Uh, yes, so experimentally, this is believed to be true, but we don't, uh, we don't have, I mean, we don't have proofs of, of any of these things. So that's one type of random model that's been studied. Uh, the, the second is erdos renyi graphs. So now every edge is chosen independently with some probability p. And this started with the work of Deckel, Lee, and Lineal. And uh, for this model, there are many results for dense random graphs. So when p is constant, then Deckel, Lee, and Lineal prove that there's a constant number of nodal domains with high probability for every non-trivial eigenvector. And then uh, uh, Aurora and Bhaskara proved that uh, if p is some polynomial in n, like n to the minus 20, then with high probability, there are only two nodal domains. Uh, for, for, OK, for, I forget if, if I think for every non-trivial eigenvector. And then uh, Huang and Rudelson uh, recently proved that, again, in this dense regime, where p is at least n to the minus c for some particular constant c, uh, which is not one. Um, uh, they proved that the nodal domains uh, actually all there are two and they have almost the same size. So what's what's proven in the dense erdos renyi case is actually is very different from what's conjectured in the sparse random deregular case, right? So in the sparse case, we it's conjectured there are many nodal domains. In the dense case, it's proven that there are only two nodal domains. And so these dense random graphs really don't behave the way they're not a discrete model for quantum chaos, you know, in the way that Smilansky and, and Kortos uh, hoped, I suppose. Uh, so that's what's known for random graphs uh, previously. Um, and 
okay, uh, before moving on to the new results, let me just make some high level comments about you know, how these proofs work and what the, what the difficulties are. So, so the, the main difficulty in, in these proofs is that nodal domains are, well, first of all, they're, they're, they're quite global objects. They're, they're connected components and you can, you can really change these, you know, you can change, you can merge two huge connected components by flipping a single edge. Um, so they're quite global objects and they're, they're very sensitive to tiny entries in the eigenvector. So if you have an eigenvector with, you know, a lot of really tiny entries, and you somehow perturb it a little bit that can flip a lot of signs. Um, so, sort of more general comment is it's, you know, eigenvector is a highly singular object. It's not something you can really write down explicitly. And most of the methods in random matrix theory for, for accessing eigenvectors deal with aggregates of eigenvectors. You do some kind of averaging over a window of eigenvectors. And nodal domains are really, it's a really question about one eigenvector. And so the main difficulties that had to be overcome is, well, how do you get information about this one eigenvector and this you know, seemingly brittle uh, feature of this one eigenvector? And the main tool that was used to overcome this is uh, delocalization results in, in random matrix theory, which um, give information about the distribution of mass of the eigenvector. So what are the sizes of the entries? Uh, so the nodal domains are concerned about the signs of the entries. Uh, but these, uh, but this is these delocalization estimates tell us about the sizes of the entries, uh, and and there are two uh, there are two types of delocalization estimates that are that are used. So one is bounds on the L infinity norm. Um, so okay, if you have a unit vector, then the, the smallest the L infinity norm can be is one over square root n, and it's been proven by Erdős, Knowles, Yao, and Yin uh, that for these dense random graph models. Um, the L infinity norm is actually within polylog of this minimum possible bound. So the eigenvectors are, are almost completely flat. And the other kind of de delocalization which is used is uh, an L2 notion of delocalization uh, due to Rudelson and Vershinen, who sometimes call it no gaps delocalization. And what this says is that if you take any set of linear size, then it has to have some significant fraction of the uh, total L2 mass of the eigenvector. So these are two different ways of articulating that the mass of uh, the entries of the eigenvector are not too skewed. Okay, so that's what I want to say about previous work. So any comments or questions on this? On which models are these uh, results? So, so these two results are known for, okay, so the first result is known for actually both models, although the, the citation I'm giving here is for dense enough GNP graphs, but I, later on I will cite another result that proves it for random deregular graphs. The second result is only known for dense enough GNP graphs, and this is a real issue. Uh, we don't have the second type of result for random deregular graphs. Okay, so let me now um, get to what uh, we proved. Uh, so here's the theorem that we proved. So, uh, so fix some degree D, that's at least three, and fix some constant, small constant alpha. Uh, let G be a random deregular graph. Then with probability approaching one, every eigenfunction of this graph with eigenvalue in this particular spectral window so minus two squared D minus one to minus two squared D minus two minus alpha. So every such eigenfunction has at least N over poly log N singleton nodal domains. Okay, so the C in the poly log N is some fixed constant and it's, it's like 300 or something. Uh, the other constants in this asymptotic notation depend on D and alpha. Now this requires a bit of parsing. There's a lot of weird you know, uh, features of this theorem. So let me go through them one by one. So the first one is what is this spectral window minus two square D minus one to minus two square D minus two minus alpha. Okay, so just to, okay. So first of all, uh, there's a famous result of Friedman, which says that if you take a random deregular graph, the spectrum is contained or the non-trivial spectrum is contained in this window 
to minus two square t minus one to plus two square t minus one plus some term that vanishes as n goes to infinity with high probability. So this window contains all the non-trivial eigenvalues. Now this window that appears in the theorem is a constant fraction uh, of of this you know this interval on the leftmost edge. So this corresponds to the most negative um, eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix. Okay, so that's this yellow region that's shown over here. And so what the theorem is saying is that if you look at the most negative eigenfunctions of the adjacency matrix in this sense, then they have many nodal domains. Now, previously we were talking in terms of index of eigenfunctions. So what are the what what, what index do these eigenfunctions correspond to? Well, okay, if you uh, so there's a Kesson McKay uh, law uh, saying that um, actually we know what the histogram of eigenvalues of such graphs looks like. And using this uh, result, you, you can you can actually see that this spectral window corresponds to eigenfunctions of index uh, some constant times n to n. Okay. So what the theorem is saying is that if you so look what at happens eigen... if you impose bipartite, then uh, I guess then you have these two sets. What happens within the sets? Yeah. Uh, if you impose bipartite. Well, that um, would then symmetrize your. I'd imagine then you symmetrize around the origin because it's kind of mm -hmm. you are yeah. near the bottom at the left. Uh, I don't know what it that, means. That, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you're the king of making things by part to make the manager. Well, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have thought about various tricks to try to flip this over to the other end of the spectrum, yeah. but none of them worked. I don't remember exactly why they didn't work right now, but maybe we can discuss it later, yeah. but it's a very good, it's a very reasonable idea. And I hope yeah, okay. one day something like that can work, but yeah. Okay. So, so this is what this spectral window uh, corresponds to. Um, okay, what about the singleton? So singleton is a new word which we're introducing and it means what you think it means, it just means a nodal domain of one vertex. So a vertex X is a singleton nodal domain if it has the opposite sign from all of its neighbors in the eigenvector, okay? And what is this N over poly log N? Well, okay, I mean, this is not linear, but uh, okay, up to poly log it's linear. And so at least in some vague sense, up to poly log this is, providing justification for the rightmost edge of that experimental picture that I that I showed you. So uh, I might the, point out, I, I can't resist pointing out here, that the work of Soden and Nazarov, which is quite remarkable, where they pr produce that many nodal domains in the random wave model, is precisely by making these uh, localized, uh, I call them semi-local nodal domains. So they are little circles in the raw, uh, uh, so they, uh, yes, they, absolutely. Yeah, it's the same feature. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, so the common feature. So their proof is for like random spherical harmonics, right? Exactly. And, and uh, yeah, uh, the benefit of singleton nodal domains is you can, you know, certify that they that they're there locally just by looking at a small piece of the of the graph or of the manifold. And indeed, this is why we focus on singleton nodal domains. Yeah, they, they invent a barrier method, which, well, we'll see your proof. It might have some features to say. Okay. Um, okay, great. So so that's the statement of the uh, theorem. So any questions about the statement of the theorem? Okay. Okay, so... What I'm going to do now is uh, first, I'm going to tell you the proof of a weaker theorem. So here's a weaker theorem. Fix the degree to be three. And now everything is the same, except I changed the spectral window to be a little bit different. Instead of this thing that was mentioned earlier, it's the window minus three to minus two minus alpha. Okay, so this is a special, like some sort of weaker case of this theorem which actually has a very simple proof, which I will now show you. Okay, so proof of the weaker theorem. So let G be a random three regular graph on N vertices. 
So the key ingredient is an L-infinity delocalization result of uh, Jiao Yang, Huang, and HDL, which is very recent from 2021, actually, uh, building on work that they did in 2016. And uh, what it shows is that uh, with high probability, if you look at every eigenfunction, with high probability, every eigenfunction of this adjacency matrix has this L infinity norm bound, polylog n over squared. So that's the input from random matrix theory. This is like a this is a heavy result that we will be using. So let's assume this. So now, how do we prove that there are many nodal domains? So here is the key claim. The claim is, if I have an eigenfunction of the adjacency matrix and the eigenvalue is sufficiently negative, so less than minus two minus alpha, and I have a vertex, which is not a single nodal domain in this eigenfunction. Okay, so it is it does have a neighbor of the same sign. Okay, then, then the conclusion is that this non-singleton nodal domain, this non-isolated uh, vertex, has to have a neighbor with significantly higher mass. And the it's higher by an amount that depends on the spectral parameter uh, lambda. So if it's, the more negative it is, the bigger this, uh, this mass of this neighbor has to be. Okay, so this is a, uh, a claim, which I'll prove in a moment. And conceptually what the claim is saying is if you have a non-isolated vertex in an eigenfunction, this leads to exponential growth of the mass of, of the entries of the eigenvector. Okay, so this type of idea has, has appeared in the continuous setting as well, where somehow the geometry of the, of the nodal sets is used to control the rate of growth of the eigenfunction. And this is a very simple, discrete manifestation of this type of idea. So any questions about the statement of the claim? Okay, so this claim has like a two-line proof. So here's the proof of the claim. So let's look at a vertex X, which is not a singleton nodal domain. And let's look at the eigenvector equation at this vertex X. So here's a picture. We have a vertex X. It has three neighbors, Y1, Y2, and Y3. And this is what the eigenvector equation says. Now, what do I know about the signs of the terms in this equation? Well, the eigenvalue is negative. Uh, let's assume with our loss of generality that F of X is positive. And I know it's not isolated. Okay, so I know that one of its neighbors, let's say Y1, has the same sign as X. Okay, so now I have this uh, eigenvector equation. Both sides are, are negative quantities, and one of the terms in the sum on the right is positive. So if I drop this term, so I just delete this edge to Y1, then I get an inequality, right? The, then the magnitude of the right-hand side is gonna go up. And so I get this inequality of the absolute values of these entries, which, which says that, okay, lambda absolute value times the absolute value of f of x is at most the sum of the absolute values of the two other neighbors, y, y2 and y3. Okay, but now, okay, the, if I rearrange this, I get that the average absolute value of the neighbors, these two remaining neighbors, is at least, you know, the magnitude of the eigenvalue divided by two times f of x, which is importantly, bounded away from one if this eigenvalue is bounded away from two. Okay, so it's, a, it's an extremely simple argument. If you're not isolated, then I can delete one of your neighbors and ob obtain this inequality on the magnitudes of the other neighbors because I you know, removed some cancellation and this leads to this, this growth. So it's a very simple claim. And now when I have this claim, I can easily, um, well, not easily, I, by combining it with the L infinity bound, I can produce many nodal domains. So how do I do that? Well, okay, here's the proof of the weaker theorem. So I choose some vertex with decently large uh, mass. So bigger than let's say one over two squared N. So there are many vertices like that. You can, you can easily convince yourself of that. Um, and now, if that vertex is a singleton nodal domain, I'm done. Otherwise, I apply the claim to produce a vertex, a neighbor Y1 with significantly larger mass. If that's a singleton nodal domain, I'm done. Otherwise, I repeat, 
uh, I apply the claim again to produce another neighbor y2 with even higher mass. And I have this path of vertices where the mass is exponentially growing. And I started at a vertex where it was already one over squared n, but this cannot go on for too long, right? Because the L infinity norm bound is polylog n over squared n. So in some, in log log n steps, this has to terminate and I have to find a singleton nodal domain. But that means I just proved that for every such vertex, there's a singleton nodal domain kind of close to it. And then if I repeat this argument, I can produce many singleton nodal domains. So it's an it's a extremely simple argument. Um, so that's the proof of the uh, weaker theorem for d equals three. So any questions about that? So wait, so the only reason it's weaker is it wasn't in the uh, Friedman range? Yeah. But the random guy is always in the Friedman range. So. Uh, right, right. So this theorem is, this is vacuous for d bigger than four. So that's why we need to actually do something else for the general case. Indeed. For d equals three, this funny thing happens that there are eigenvalues in this range here. And so you can say something about them. And and the three is, uh, you heavily <laughs> used that the right hand side only had three terms, yeah. Uh, correct, correct. So you can you get this to work for four also actually, but <laughs> but that's about it. So, uh, okay, so, so the remark, yes, the same proof works. For general D, you get that for eigenfunctions in this window, minus D to minus D minus one minus alpha. This is true, but okay, there are no eigenvalues in that window for D bigger than for D five or greater. So this, this is some very specific thing that is working for low degrees. Okay, so, so, so nonetheless, this, this captured, I wanted to show this conceptual tension between the growth rates and the, uh, the singleton null domains. So let me now um, tell you the ideas that go into the general, the proof for general D. Okay, so what's the proof for general D? So let T be a random D regular graph. And uh, let's look at uh, eigenfunction F, uh, normalized to be an L2 uh, unit vector and um, with eigenvalue in this range that was stated in the main theorem. And I'm now gonna show that this has to have many singleton nodal domains. Okay, so, so the, the key, uh, one of the key things in the proof is that you need to, is that you need to use different techniques depending on how the mass of the eigenvector is distributed. So there are two cases in the proof. So case one is that the L2 mass of this uh, eigenvector F is not localized on a small set of size delta. So delta is some fixed small constant, which I won't talk more about. So that's case one that the mass is not localized on a small set, the L2 mass. And that corresponds to this histogram that's drawn on the left here, which is a cartoon. I've drawn the magnitudes of the eigenvector entries. And okay, some are bigger than others, but it's not the case that, you know, most of the mass is, is concentrated on a, a small set. That's case one. Case two is, well, that doesn't happen. And case two is that, well, actually, almost all of the L2 norm of the vector is localized on a small set of size delta n. And that corresponds to the picture on the right, which is, you know, there's like a peak on this, some small set S. Okay, so in, in, the, in the mathematical physics literature, sometimes people call case two scarring, which is L2 localization of massive and eigenfunction. And so case one is no scarring in this, in this jargon. And so we'll use two very different techniques to handle these two cases. Okay, so let me talk about case one first. So let's just, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do simulations, isn't it true that like the Rudelson version in no gaps, the, the localization holds here and actually we don't know this, but like case Absolutely. one all the time. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. So this is one of the open questions. So we believe case two never happens actually, okay. but we don't know how to prove it. But what did Yao and co prove in terms of QUE? 
yeah, so QUE, uh, okay, so they Party proved an L, L infinity bound, mm -hmm. first of all. And their QUE is something like if you fix a bunch of test functions in advance, then if you look at the averages with respect to the squared eigenvector entries with respect to those test functions, and those are concentrated, that's actually not enough to rule out case two. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, because you have to fix the test functions in advance. Right, but if this localizes, well, I guess yeah, you don't know where it's localizing physically, right? Okay. Right, yeah, that's the problem. You don't know where it's localizing. If you knew more information about where it would localize, then maybe you could push yeah. it through, but we because, couldn't uh, figure out how to do that. In the, in the quantum chaos world, QUE implies no scoring. That's a theorem. <laughs> okay. uh, right, right, right. Yeah, so I think there's this difference between this probabilistic QUE and the okay, true okay. QUE. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, so, okay. So indeed, we, I mean, we believe case two never happens, but nonetheless, we prove that even if it did happen, we would have the total domain. Um, okay, so let's, let's see what the proofs are in the two cases. So case one, case one is eigenfunction is not localized. So what that means is for every subset of the vertices of small size, the L2 mass is bounded away from one. So in this case, we are able to appeal to this uh, very you know, powerful theorem of Backhouse and Segedy, uh, which uses graph limit theory, which basically shows that this uh, discrete random wave conjecture due to L1 is true if you know that this L2 mass is not localized. So with the additional assumption that the L2 mass is not localized, Backhouse and Segedy uh, proved, proved the following statement that um, uh, such an eigenfunction of a random deregular graph looks locally like a random eigenvector of an infinite deregular tree with high probability. Okay, so I'll say something more precise in a moment. But what this is saying is that if you don't have this localization, there is some kind of local random model for what the eigenfunction looks like. And rather than stating their entire you know, weak convergence results, let me state the consequence of it that's relevant for, for this question of nodal domains. It's the following. Uh, what they prove is that if you take this eigenvector and you look at a neighborhood of a random vertex, so you choose a random vertex in the graph, graph X and you look at its D neighbors. So that's this cartoon that's pictured in this cloud over here. Now, if you look at the restriction of the eigenvector to, to those d plus one entries, you get a you know you get a you get a random vector, and and what they prove is that this random vector is very close to a certain multivariate Gaussian with a very explicit covariance matrix, which is shown here, or at least some of its entries are shown here. So this is the discrete. This is this is exactly what Elon conjectured, and they prove that under this delocalization assumption, this is actually true. Okay, so I'm, I'm skipping several details here, but uh, the point is that these local restrictions of the eigenfunctions have a nice Gaussian approximation. Now, what's the key feature of this Gaussian approximation? Well, if you look at this covariance matrix, this lambda over D appears, and if lambda is a oh, negative wait, wait. Eigen can, can you go slowly yes. here? This seems quite sure. important because it's a bit like Berry's conjecture, as you said. So is yes. the claim for every eigenfunction, for almost every, what's the claim here? Okay, so the precise claim in uh, Backhouse and Segedy is for every eigen, actually it's for every even pseudo eigenfunction. Okay. Um, uh, this uh, local distribution uh, is close to some multiple of this Gaussian. Okay, that's what's proven in Backhouse and Segedy. Now so, the problem so is- uh, yes. I'm just trying to translate because of course I think of the continuum. Um, so that would be the same very conjectures that if, in these kind of situations, every eigenfunction looks like a random random monochromatic wave. This would be the uh, tree analog. Uh, correct. This would be the tree analog. Right. Now the whole, uh, the only weakness of Backhouse and Segedy is that they prove that it, these local distributions converge to a multiple of yeah, this Gaussian okay. and the multiple could be zero. Oh, okay, 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 <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> okay, so, so, that's what this whole localization business yeah, is about. That's, uh, yeah, okay, I got it, I understand. Okay, yeah. 
So, so if it's not localized, but, there's but, some tightness kind of thing. But it's that true happens. for every eigenfunction. It's, in fact, it's actually true for every pseudo, pseudo eigenfunction, okay. that's all, even with the pseudo ness just being a constant. So it's true for like yeah, all kinds okay. of things that are not really eigenfunctions. Right, right. It's very hard to exploit the exact eigenvalue. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's very hard to exploit the exact eigenvalue. Exactly. So, okay. So nonetheless, if we have this, then uh, you can show that under this delocalization assumption, this is true. And now we're in business because this is a local random model with some Gaussians that with negative correlation. So, you know, this is saying that the signs of the neighbors are negatively correlated with the sign of X. And then you can do some very explicit calculations similar to some, you know, Gomans Williamson type calculation for rounding some different programs. And you just can just explicitly calculate that with the probability that a vertex is a single general domain is a, is a constant. And this is indeed very similar to this Nazarov Soden type of argument. It's completely local. It's based on a local random model. Nikhil, can you just go back to this matrix? I'm missing something. Isn't it, its rank is supposed to be D, right? Not D plus one, because you have one less degree of freedom. Um. Yeah, okay, that's true. Um, well, so, okay, so, so so there are some stars here, which I haven't specified what goes over there. Uh huh. And so, let's see, I, uh, I guess okay, if you fill those in, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, so. So stars and there's some other stuff there that I'm not uh, emphasizing. Should, should we think about it as just independent Gaussians plus a multiple of the all ones matrix. So you kind of add or subtract sure, something sure. from everything. And then you, you kind of condition on this linear thing that yeah. you have. Okay. Uh, you, you, uh, could say, you, you could write it that way. You could write it orthogonal to the all ones uh, as well, if you want. Um, uh, I, I guess the reason I wrote it this way is I wanted to emphasize that the, uh, you know, cover, the, the correlations between just x and yi are negative when the eigenvalue is negative. Okay. Uh, and so that's actually important. Uh, I mean, first of all, because if the eigenvalue is positive, you cannot have any isolated vertices. I mean, you just can't. So, um, uh, but indeed, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other comment or question about this? Okay, so if do, do they have, have to... do they have some percolation concerning global components theory? Uh, you mean backhouse and Segedi? Yeah. Uh, no. So what they have is so what I'm telling you is about one hop neighborhoods. What they prove is some kind of like Benjamin Stram, like Mark. So Benjamin it's all Shram local. It's all the semi -local. So It's all local. It's all local. Yeah. It's all balls of some fixed radius. Yeah. I mean, you can derive the covariance matrix for a ball of any fixed radius. But yeah, it's local. Any other? Yeah. Okay. So in this case, we do this explicit calculation and uh, we get linear number of nodal domains. And we don't really use this two square D minus two in this case. This is really, we just use that the eigenvalue is negative. So that's case one. That's mostly done for us by backhouse integrity. Now on to case two. So case two wait, is wait, a wait a minute. In yes. their work, lambda can't be positive. Uh, sorry, sorry. Lambda can be positive, but uh, remember to get nodal domains, we want an X which has the opposite sign from all of its neighbors. Right, but their theorem has nothing to do with positive. Uh, correct, correct. Their theorem works for all lambda, but when lambda is positive, you don't get isolated vertices. I mean, also because it's impossible, but uh, you don't get. Uh, Okay, I'm yeah. just clarifying the where lambda is positive. Then they, they, they don't use lambda as negative. Yeah. No, they don't. They don't. We we uh, what this means is we don't use this d minus two business. All we use about the eigenvalue in this case one is that it's negative. Yeah. Okay. So now let's move on to case two. So case two is the one where the L two mass is localized on a set of size delta n. So you cannot use backhouse and Segedi. So let's say it's localized on a set S. 
Okay, so here's the argument in this localized case, L2 localized case. So there are three steps in the argument. So the first step is to pass to the induced subgraph on this S, this localized set S. So the set has delta n vertices. And there, there are two features of this that we will use. So one is that it kind of looks like a tree. Now, uh, what I mean by that really is that the average degree of the induced subgraph is close to two. And also for all, uh, you know, for all, for all subgraphs of this induced subgraph, also the average degree is close to two. Okay, so this is what I mean by looks like a tree. It has very low average degree. This is something you can prove just by some fairly simple, I mean, this is like a well-known thing, okay? So, so that's a combinatorial feature of S. And because almost all the L2 mass of the eigenvector is on S, what this means is that the eigenfunction restricted to S has a similar quadratic form as the eigenfunction on the whole graph, right? I mean, if I truncate away this tiny amount of L2 mass, it's not gonna change the energy. So for the second feature, I used the L2 localization assumption. Okay, so I pass to this induced subgraph S, which looks like a tree while pres approximately preserving the energy. So I'm gonna record that on the left. So lambda is the quadratic form of the original eigenvector. And now this is approximately equal to the quadratic form with this subgraph, induced subgraph S, which kind of looks like a tree. Any questions about this step? Okay. I think I understand now exactly why this is an issue when it isn't in the continuum. In the continuum, there's a fixed manifold. <laughs> and so when you uh, ha have uh, localization, it means you, your thing you're changing all the time. So you, ha you have to control uh, in this fashion that you're doing right now where this is trying to localize. Well, the continuous model never changes the manifold. We just go up the spectrum. Uh, uh, by, by never changes, you mean th there's no analog of doing this? Yeah, you don't have this yeah. difficulty. In other words, I'm saying in the continuum, if you have um, localization, there's, uh, by definition, there's the manifold's fixed. You don't keep on increasing mm -hmm. n and changing the graph. Yeah. Uh, it's a deterministic statement, meaning if you, mm -hmm. if you know that the eigenfunctions, uh, what you call scar, which is this very strong form of scarring, then it's happening on some fixed thing. And then you can use the uh, observables, as you were saying, that to test functions to show that can't happen. Okay. I, I'm just uh, saying- like QUE test function. Yeah. You mean exactly. using, uh, I see. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I see, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, good. So, so step one, we pass to the subgraph S, which looks like a tree while preserving the energy. Okay, now step two, we assume there are very few singleton nodal domains. So let's assume that, that's a highlighted phrase here. Now step two says, if there are a few nodal do domains, you can delete them and also delete some edges from this tree. I'm gonna call this pruning while preserving the energy, okay? Now this is very similar to the that little argument I showed you in the d equals three case, where you delete if you know if you're not isolated, you can delete sort of a, you can delete an edge where both endpoints have the same sign without, uh, you know, without without reducing the absolute value of the energy. Okay, so this is kind of like that. So if there are very few singleton nodal domains, you can delete them and you can prune this tree into some further edge subgraph, so it's not an induced subgraph anymore, call that P, which has almost the same energy and now has maximum degree one less. Okay, so it has maximum degree D minus one. So the original graph had degree D, now this pruned, you know, almost tree, P has maximum degree D minus one. And now the reason you can do this uh, modification modification without messing up the energy is this eigenvector delocalization bound of Huang and Yao. So if you don't have any control over the eigenvector, you cannot do stuff like this without really messing up the energy. But I mean, with such a bound, you have quite a, quite a bit of slack. So now we pass to this orange subgraph P of this S, again, while preserving the energy. 
So I have this chain of approximate equalities. Lambda is equal to the quadratic form of G, which is approximately equal to the quadratic form of S, which is approximately equal to the quadratic form of P, which is a tree-like graph of degree less than D minus one. And this is where the crucial L infinity delocalization was used. And finally, we now just prove a, we just prove a statement like a spectral graph theory type of statement saying, if you have such a graph, if you have a tree-like graph whose max, if you have a tree-like graph in this sense, then its largest eigen, its spectral radius is bounded by two squared maximum degree minus one plus some slack. And the maximum degree is D minus one. So this gives you two squared D minus two plus alpha. But now if you look at the chain of inequalities, we just proved that lambda is less than two square D minus two under the assumption that there are a few singleton nodal domains. So that's the contrapositive of what we wanted to show, right? So um, yeah, so therefore if lambda is more negative than minus two square D minus two, then there have to be many nodal domains. And that's, that's the proof. It's a very simple combinatorial proof. Um, and this is where this D minus two comes from, from this pruning process where you pass to a subgraph of lower degree while preserving the energy. And that is, uh, you know, that's that's the proof. Uh, uh, that's the proof of the theorem. So um, any questions or comments on this proof? So not only you have uh, like lots of singletons, you have a lot of L2 energy on the singletons. Um, yeah, you have a significant amount of L2 energy on the singleton. Yeah, you can conclude that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this D minus two is clearly an artifact of this proof, but we actually could not figure out a way to extract a lower degree subgraph, which preserves the energy. Uh, and I mean, I, actually there are examples where you, you cannot do it using the same type of method, so. Clearly, this is an artifact of the proof. Um, anyway, yeah, that's that's the proof of, of this theorem. Um, and OK, there's a complementary like mini observation, which I just want to mention, which is this shows that there are a lot of tiny nodal domains. But you can also just use the expander mixing lemma, which is a very global property, to see that there actually there have to be two giant nodal domains as well. So if you look at the union of the two largest nodal domains in a random regular graph, it has to contain most of the vertices. So this is just immediate consequence of the expander mixing lemma. Um, and so altogether, this gives some kind of, I don't know, weird picture of this uh, distribution of nodal domains. There are lots of tiny ones. There are these you know, two huge ones, or a lot of the vertices are contained in the two biggest ones. And then we don't really know what's in the middle. We don't know what you know the shapes of them are like and things like that. So, so that's it. And I'll just end with the list of open questions. So one is, okay, improve this window, improve the spectral window. And the cleanest approach to doing that would be to show, as uh, Ronan mentioned, that case two never happens. So we're always in case one. This is a, a very clean and you know, probably true conjecture in random matrix theory. Um, another question is to investigate what happens for erdos Reni in the as you approach sparse graphs. So we know for dense graphs, there are two nodal domains. We know for sparse random regular graphs, there is some interesting structure. And so what happens is, is there some critical probability at which this interesting structure of the nodal domains emerges? This was suggested by Eldan, Huang, and Rulson. Uh, okay, study the sizes, shapes of other domains. And maybe the most speculative question, which is completely speculative is, is this at all useful in saying anything about manifolds? Uh, I don't know. So yeah, that, that's it. Thank you, Mikhail. Yeah, I have a few comments and questions. Um, in the manifold case, uh, what you're doing is you're actually taking a random graph. While the only ran the only results, to say that I was mentioning of uh, Sodan Nazarov, are about a random function. They don't take a random metric, so there's nothing known about a random metric as far as I know on this kind of problem. 
Um, but in the random, since you have this passage to this uh, semi-local behavior by Segedi or whoever you were uh, explaining, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder why you're not finding not just these singletons, but other connected components. So the, uh, the work of, say, Wigman, myself, and Kanzani shows there's a universal distribution for these random monochromatic waves of of the connected components of the topologies of the nodal domains. There's a unique distribution. We don't know much about it. We know some things. And it's very different in two and three, uh, two and three dimensions because of percolation. So uh, why can't you produce other nodal shaped nodal domains besides singletons, which might allow you to, or maybe that's connected with this range in, in where you are in the spectrum. Is that possible? Um, so let's see. So I suspect if you push this, you could, instead of singleton, you could ask about vertices, which do yeah. not have a path to the boundary at distance k. Yes, and create other ones with positive yeah. probability. Uh, you, uh, yeah. So I what we show I is think everything you may that's... be able to do that. Uh -huh. I mean, that's exactly what we prove. We prove everything. So suppose you ask about what, what's the topology of a nodal domain in, in n dimensions of a random function. And we show every topological type which can be embedded in Rn plus one, that's the only condition on the topology, uh, mm -hmm. occurs and occurs with positive probability. That's quite difficult to prove, but that's what we show. And it seems to me that that's the next step here. Uh, singletons are just these most localized guys, but you are allowed to take, yeah, neighborhood K and then you should have every, it should be a collection of graphs that uh, occur with positive probability in the limit. Yeah, so so let's see. So case one, I think this just works out. Like you just plug in the backhouse Segedi theorem, you get some larger covariance matrix supported on a ball and you can you can do the calculation and it's fine. Case two um, might be a little trickier. So this pruning thing, yeah, you have to find some way to do it under this weaker assumption, which yeah, it, 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 it sounds like a reasonable thing to try. Um, yeah, it, it's... and then the mm -hmm. the thing that you won't see that is dramatically different in the manifold case because the manifold's fixed, the dimension doesn't go to infinity. Is is a massive difference between dimension two and three. That the random function wants to have a giant connected component, which is a totally global percolation thing in dimension three, there's this kind of dominant nodal domain that just swamps everybody else out in dimension mm -hmm. three, but not in dimension two. So in uh -huh. dimension three, you can make these small components. So Nazarov is free of dimension. So you, and what we showed is that every topological type, as I said, appears. That's purely local and will be, I'm sure you'll have a similar thing. But the question of the global, because you want a tree somehow, um, it's going to be something, yeah, that's because your manifold is changing all the time. So I don't know what it means, but there is something fundamentally different about a random monochromatic wave and it's zero set. It's zero set in dimension three, there, there, there's this massive uh, percolating component. And this was recently proved, by the way, by Hugo uh, Copan and his co-workers. That's a mm -hmm. quite remarkable thing. Yeah. So, I, but I would love to see what's happening here in the graph. Anyway, beautiful, beautiful lecture. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the comments. Any other questions from here, from the Zoom? So, I'm I'm just wondering if, uh, like, may, maybe you can use these ideas to show that you have. Uh, like delocalization, uh, just, I mean, not clear to me how exactly, but just, just to kind of consider this uh, induced uh, tree. And then, I mean, maybe you actually get that you have too many nodal domains and somehow reach a contradiction that will show that case two doesn't happen. Do yeah, that's an interesting thought. I mean, there is this tension between the nodal domains and the localization. And uh, what you would need is you, yeah, you'd need some other way uh, of saying something about the nodal domains in this localized set. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it sounds sounds. I mean, it's hard to say right now. Of I don't have any great intuition about what that in would be. Case, but you don't get something that's stronger than what you get in simulations, at least, right? Like the number of singleton no nodal domains that you can prove in case two is not more than. Well, no, actually... no, 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 no. So yeah, the, the, the thing is you still get N over polylog. So it's not anywhere near violating. Uh, all right. And yeah. you actually, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. And you expect like Omega of N. Yeah. So that's yeah, not... I, I mean, to do what you're saying, you'd need some further information about like that they can't all be clustered in a small, you, you know, about uh, their, how they're distributed within the graph, which, um, yeah, I mean, I guess as... Uh, yeah, I mean, there are certainly predictions about how they're uh, distributed if you believe the random wave model, but you need to find some other way of proving them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, the, the main issue is the is the insensitivity of the of the nodal count to to the to the size of the of f at the vertices. So you can have a lot of fluctuation around zero but with f very very small so even if you're in a in a localized setting sure. you can still have like many many uh, yeah but this shows that you have it with that large okay maybe let's you know but this. but this is here he uses the fact that the lambda is negative uh, sure. so it yeah. might be so so sorry like one last thing do you think you can get any insights about positive lambdas uh, from these ideas or? Um, so, yeah, okay. So as Peter was saying, one thing we tried is we we wanted to find some some transformation that would, you know, kind of do this bipartiteness thing that would map this negative edge of the spectrum to the positive edge of spectrum of some other random graph model. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, we could not make it work, but it's uh, it seems conceptually reasonable. There was no barrier to doing that. Uh, I mean, d directly this, I mean, you know, the, the, the argument that goes into this pruning is is literally just that you write the quadratic form and you drop terms that have the opposite sign. And so this, uh, yeah, th this doesn't work out for positive eigenvalues. Um, uh, so, you... so. But how about numerically? Do you find that numerically that when lambda's negative there are many more singletons. And while uh, when yes. that is positive, maybe you should be looking for these guys which aren't singletons, but are maybe, uh, of course, when lambda gets near two root two, let's say it's three regular, uh, maybe, but maybe when it's just a little bit positive, you could get by with localized graphs which are not singletons, but maybe of some fixed depth. What do you find right. numerically? Yeah, so so let's see. So when lambda is positive, you cannot have even one singleton nodal domain because it violates. Right, right. you don't have a singleton, so, but you could have many small kind of small other right? structures. That's what I mean by semi-local. Yeah, 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 semi-local. So that is kind. Of, that's what's observed. That as soon as you cross zero, you start seeing singletons, and then in the end, they kind of really dominate the count of nodal domains. Right, right. So and, it's clear that in order to deal with lambda positive. You really need to start looking at not singletons, but uh, yeah. some small other configurations which locally have lambda positive. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's right. Um, I mean, on the other hand, you know, if you uh, if you actually proved the this no gaps delocalization, you, you prove that you're always in case one, then this this uh, this random wave model this is strong enough even in the positive case to do what you're saying, which is yeah. prove that these yeah. other substructures exist. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I will emphasize again, just because I think it's of interest to you, maybe that uh, all the progress, other than the few theorems you stated, which are non-random. So those are very much based on uh, forcing sign changes in order to create nodal domains. Uh, otherwise, we don't know how to make nodal domains. But all the theorems in the continuum are for random functions, which are and not for random. Uh, metrics or random mm. systems. So uh, you have, that's why, I mean, if you were doing just the random function, it would be much easier for you, yeah. And so random metric, is is that an interesting thing to study? 
Oh yeah, uh, or the Berry conjecture, if you could prove it even in the red for random metric, and we'd have to define random, but mm -hmm. nothing is known. No, 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 no. Nobody knows the the exchange of of um, yeah. Okay, it's a separate question. No, Berry's conjecture. There's no case where Berry is known. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the only cases where Barry's conjectures are known are sort of in these arithmetic cases where other tools, completely different tools, are proved, and then they certainly not for the random metric, but they for a chaotic system. So you see, he made a conjecture, which is that the chaos creates a random matrix theory, and that I don't believe for a second. It's random creates random. So they are chaotic systems for which the eigenvalues are Poissonian. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's a completely separate thing. But you are averaging of you are changing the the yeah. you're, you're changing the object at each as n goes to infinity, while in the quantum chaos problem that uh, Barry was talking about is you have a mechanical system with two degrees of freedom only. It's fixed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in those settings, are things like these delocalization estimates known? I don't know what the analog would be, but like this Huang and Yao type of result. Uh, no, only in the arithmetic case. Mm -hmm. That's okay. uh, where you prove QUE. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's known that for almost all eigenfunctions, much more is known mm -hmm. by work of Schneerman, yeah, mm -hmm. and then Colin de Verdier and Zeldich. So the theorems, uh, and you, know, I think you know that theorem maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and then Tharaman has made graph analog of that. So you're yeah. familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. OK, I guess uh, thanks, Nikhil. For, uh, oh, thanks, everybody. Uh, um, are you going to make it in time to join us for lunch, or should we go ahead <laughs> without you? Who are you talking to, Nikhil? Uh, I might take a while yeah, to get no, that, that was a joke. Yeah, but okay. Uh, okay, thanks again, Nikhil.